Hi, and uh, welcome to this installment of Frank and Mary in Hudson. Uh, with me is my co-host Janice Long, uh, and we have two wonderful guests for you today. As, as, you, as you know, the purpose of this show is to introduce you to the people and the programs that you ought to know about as a Hudson senior. Everybody knows Janice, of course you have to know Janice, right? <laughs> um, but one of the things that we've talked about in a, in a couple of our previous programs has been the Daybreak program that has been going on now for a while, and, and Janice can talk a little bit about just how it started. But we wanted you to learn some more about that because it has been expanding now um, to a couple of other communities, and we wanted to talk about the program, and also Janice uh, was able to get, um, Re uh, excuse me, Rebecca Gallo, from uh, Metro West Health Foundation. Health Foundation, right? Which is the grant source for some of the, the, the funds to kind of talk about this program and others, right? Um, and then um, Janice also invited Marie Kelly, who had come to this program a lot with her spouse. Mm -hmm. And so we just want, we were hoping to be able to talk about some of the issues that, that spouses deal with uh, when you've got a spouse or a loved one who has got memory issues. So. Janice, thank you very much for being back, and thank you for inviting these wonderful guests. So, do you want you want to talk a little bit to, uh, to w w about what this experience has been? Yeah. Well, we started the Daybreak program in 2012, yeah. but right now um, it has expanded to the Marlboro Senior Center and yeah. Northboro Senior Center. And what it is is a social day program for older adults. Um, that now offers up to nine hours of respite for the caregiver, um, somebody who is dealing with a loved one who may have Alzheimer's or dementia, Parkinson's, or some other illness. Yeah. And so the okay. program offers the caregiver the opportunity to re-engage socially um, or to get involved in an educational program or a mm -hmm. self-help program that um, might contribute to a healthier self because caregiving is um, very tiresome and it's very challenging at times. Yeah, I know we've, talk, we've talked about hearing John Zeisel and others talk about the fact that the thing about all these disease that in, diseases that involve memory loss, is they're like family diseases. It's mm -hmm. like everybody is kind of getting hit at the, at the same right. time. And, and it's, it's, you know, often 24-7 and they very um, rarely have the opportunity, unless you have money that you can afford to go to a social day program, a yeah. private social day program. A lot of people, you know, just stay at home and, and they deal with the caregiving at home on a day-to-day -day basis and they don't get out very often. The program also offers the opportunity for the loved one to re-engage socially and to connect with other people in the program. So let's talk to Marie a little bit. Right. So, oh, you've been dying for this, <laughs> right? As, as, as you know, we, you know we, I, we always, I always joke with Janice because she's, she's, she, she's such a wonderful, above, right? Yeah. Wonderful. She's like, oh, I don't know on TV. I'm not sure. <laughs> so, Marie, can you just kind of talk about that? Talk, talk about um, just what it was, what, what, you know, what it's been like, you know, um, having a loved one mm -hmm. who, who had memory loss issues. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can just kind of talk about, just give us some background on how, you know, how you came to learn about that, how that all happened, mm -hmm. and, and how the, the, the Daybreak program connected into all of that, mm -hmm. right? And then maybe we can kind of talk about some issues that are even related to what other things you might, you know, in, you know, in, in hindsight, if, if other, some other things have been available in the community. What would have been, what would, what would make mm -hmm. the, the community you know, the, the, the community that, that, that would be really helpful, both to a person with memory loss and to the folks who are caring for them. Mm -hmm. How about that? Uh, good, Sounds good. good. Yeah, okay. uh, my sister is a nurse, and she heard that uh, Hudson was beginning the Daybreak program. So I interviewed with Lisa Gardner, the facilitator, mm -hmm. who is absolutely wonderful. I think um, we, we had, had Lisa on the mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, she is wonderful. And um, what I was looking for was some sort of social interaction for my husband, beyond myself. And um, he actually fell in love with the program. He participated for two and a half years, weekly, and um, made a lot of friends. Um, I think it was the consistency um, in the activities. What, what, what do you mean? Well, they, they start, start with lunch, and uh, they go on from there with um, uh, conversations. Um, background conversations, but also local um, news, 
uh, national news. Uh, huh? It's quite something to watch. I had the opportunity to go after my husband was done and um, to see it. But they have um, games, they compete, and they come together um, and bond as a group. Um, probably individuals that would never have met in life. Hmm. Um, they come with some sort of disability. They're still functioning in the community. Yeah. But they um, cheer each other on and they root for each other. And when they don't want to participate in a game, they they won't stop cheering them. <laughs> That's great. It is wonderful. Yeah. That's great. See, because you've got people who are really experiencing a lot of those things. Yes. Kind of on their own. Mm -hmm. Now, can, can you just, you know, if just for my sake, because I know you, know you and Janice have been, you know, Known each other for a long time. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Can you just kind of talk about the, you know, the the the, kind of the antecedents to that? So, you know, when you were, you know, when, when your husband was first going through memory loss issues, mm -hmm. kind of what were the challenges? What were the good parts? What were the bad parts? I know. Th I know you, you had. I think you had mentioned earlier. You li you're living in in um, Westboro now with mm -hmm. your son. Yes. Were you, were you living with him at that time when all of this was happening? We, mo we moved in with my son, um, and uh, I have to say he was very helpful in terms of um, uh, working with my husband. Yeah. Um, my husband um, has been ill for some time, and um, I really felt that um, there had to be something that he could do mm -hmm. beyond um, being at home. And um, that's why I was searching, but there wasn't an awful lot available to him until I found the Daybreak program. And did, did, the, did the, the memory loss issues come, um, did those symptoms come over a long period of time, or was it, or was it really pretty sudden? Well, I don't know how much you know about it, but um, oftentimes people mask um, their disability. So I yeah. really don't know the answer to that. Um, I'm sure that it, it was a while, but um, I, I wasn't totally aware of it. Right. Right, because who wants mm -hmm. to be? That's right. right. Who yeah. wants to be really kind of talking? Well, people about substitute that. words, and they, you know, they they, uh, they do something different. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. and that's good, that's a and that's a real challenge. Mm -hmm. yes. So, so when you knew that your when it became clear to you that your husband had had pretty serious memory loss issues, at that point, did you go? Did you get a diagnosis from a doctor? Did you were you in, kind of intuiting this? How did you come to be sure? It's it's quite a process. It takes years, actually. Um, and um, it actually was a year from the time I tried to find a neurologist before he actually saw a neurologist, and another year before he had an actual um, diagnosis. So. And, and that was that because there simply wasn't anybody around, yeah. or everybody was backed up. What? Why backed you up. Yeah, that's that's really what it was. Um, so in the meantime, um, I, I felt that the social interaction was important, um, and it, it kept him involved yeah. in, in the uh, community and what was going on. So that's why I searched, and um, I was very fortunate to find Hudson. And the fact you had mentioned before that just connecting with other people, mm -hmm. how that made a difference for him, and I can speak on behalf of my experience with my mother. Um, I know I worked all the all day and I had somebody stay with her in her home and then I thought well maybe um, I'll see if mom wants to go to daybreak on Thursdays and she loved the program she went she did I would take her to work with me on Thursdays and I didn't know that. she did and um, she loved it as well and it was connecting with people mm -hmm. because as she was home um, we've talked about this People sometimes self-isolate because they know that there's something different about them now. Mm -hmm. And people don't come and visit like they used to. And so she was home with a caregiver and really not doing a whole lot except watching TV or putzing around the kitchen. Right. And so she really liked the social aspect of having lunch with other people, um, engaging in other activities, and they really have fun. Mm -hmm. um, well, then this is uh, no judgments whatsoever. Uh, which is unusual um, in regular, uh, everyday activities. Uh, oftentimes, people are held back because they can't do what they used to do, or they're not exactly right. the way they used to be. So um, it's just a wonderful place to be. It's it's a moment in time, and it's been wonderful for him. So I guess I'd ask I'd ask both of you then, because I, I I didn't realize that your mother hadn't been part of the program too. 
was there, was there much resistance at first to his going or to her going to the program? I figured you probably made your mother go because it was your, your you're the daughter, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, but, I was just but she wondering. looked forward to it actually. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there was, was there was no resistance whatsoever. It it was something he thought of as being fun. Yeah. It became his program, yeah. and um, he would uh, talk about it the day before and wonder what they were going to do. Oh, really? And then on the way home, he would talk about what they had done. So it was it was more than just three hours. And the thing um, that was wonderful for me was it gave me the opportunity to see um, that I needed some time. Uh, I, I really didn't have a clue. <laughs> I was telling Janice <laughs> that the first day, um, Lisa, uh, the facilitator, said, just get yourself a book and sit in the car and read it. And um, I left the building, and I, I honestly didn't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> free time. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. What's yeah. that? Free time. <laughs> it didn't yeah. Exist. Yeah. It didn't but he exist. loved it. He absolutely loved it. Now, did did you stay for for for? some of the programs themselves? I didn't go in with him. I wanted it to be his program, and, and that's the way it was developed. I, um, I went after the fact I went in, and um, I was amazed, really amazed. And from the, the times that you've been even after the fact, did you, mm -hmm. did you have you seen those experiences of people kind of going in and initially being resistant, or do people typically just start off really wanting to be there? I have not seen resistance. Have you, Janet? We've had a couple that weren't sure they wanted to go. They did not want to leave their loved one because yeah. they had been with them for so long. So it took a little bit for them to get used to being, I think we had one person, it just didn't work. They had mm. to go back home. Yeah. But um, for the most and, part... And, and in this, that case, that was, the, it was, was that the caregiver or was that the person who it had was memory the, loss? It was the person who had the, the who memory, had the memory loss. loss. Just it was just... Who, who couldn't handle no. it. Right. But um, for the most part... Um, if people show resistance, it's very little, and until they get into the program and start interacting and they mm -hmm. see that they are accepted, like you said, yes. that makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everybody wants to be with people that accept them, mm -hmm. and this program does that. And as you say, people who are, it's like you're getting cut some slack by your peers. Yeah. It's not by somebody that you think is kind of like doing you a favor. Right. It's like, it's actually by your peers. That's mm -hmm. the most interesting thing for me. Yeah. And, and among the caregivers, was, was, was there any, did you get to know any of the other caregivers? Yes, that happened. And um, Was that part of the program, or was, just, was that kind of more informal? Uh, no, somewhere into the first year, I think, uh, Bay Path did a, a program, six weeks, I think, for caregivers, which actually was very helpful in learning um, uh, the need, yeah. you know, for taking care of yourself. Uh, which makes sense to me now. It didn't at the time. Yeah. But um, well, of course, when you've been in the middle of it forever. Exactly. Right? Yeah. You don't realize um, at all. But I did get to know um, some of the other families, and we would sit outside for a half an hour or so and talk. I've gone for coffee with some of the other caregivers, um, phone calls. So it, it really did help um, because you can compare, you know, where they are, you know, to what you're doing. Right. It's almost yeah. like an impromptu support yes, group, it is, if yeah. you will. Yeah. yeah, it's wonderful. Because it seems like so, so much of, of the issues relating to memory loss and diseases that cause memory loss is, mm -hmm. you know, as I always try to describe it, this isn't rocket science. It isn't like we're trying to develop the cure here. Mm -hmm. That would all be great. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to develop very practical, just ways of dealing with day-to-day -day problems. Yes. And probably nobody's better at doing that than somebody who's been a caregiver for a while because yes. they might have confronted it already. Exactly. Where you just kind of, because a lot of it's got to be trial and error, right? Well, it is, yeah. Um, but there's always someone that's gone through what you're dealing with. Right. And uh, right. it's helpful, yeah. Mm -hmm. So can we, can we want to talk a little bit about, so why why did, did Metro West get involved in this? So uh, or excuse me, to start off with, for the mm -hmm. folks who are here, what is Metro? We, every once in a while, in the mm -hmm. at least in the community of people who look for money, right? You hear about the Metro West Health Foundation, mm -hmm. right? But beyond that, people I, I think have very little idea. Uh, can you just kind of talk about that a little sure. bit, and then talk about your interest in these issues, and then kind of how you got involved in it? Yeah, is that all right? I'll give you that the past history of the foundation. Okay. So we were formed in the late 90s when Leonard Morse Hospital and Fernandez Union Hospital, which were two nonprofit hospitals, yeah. sold to a for-profit entity. 
So when that happens, this, the funds from the sale go to a corresponding charitable purpose. So that's where the funds from the foundation come from initially. Oh, because you were a non because the hospitals mm -hmm. were non profits. Yes, mm -hmm. and now they're you know a for profit group all its own. Okay. So we have an endowment that comes from there. So we fund essentially public health programs in 25 towns in Metro West. 25 towns, and, mm -hmm. and how did that how did that come about? So yeah. that was the towns that the hospitals served, according to the attorney general. Mm -hmm. oh. I see. Um, and there's a special pot of money for Native and a special pot for Framingham given the hospitals are in those towns. Oh. Um, and so we've been and it was a fairly substantial amount of money, if I well, my so recollection um, Right now, our down is about $100 million. $100 million. And then another 50 got added to it. Hmm. Not nothing. That's not good. Really not nothing. <laughs> so the foundation's been around for quite a while. Yep. We right? put about $5 million into the, into the community every year. Five million every year. Every year. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just the, the numbers are once again for folks who are used to seeing grants in the you know mm -hmm. a thousand to hear a thousand mm -hmm. they, they're like staggering. Mm -hmm. numbers. It's a huge asset to the community, I would say. It's, it's tremendous. Oh it is. Yes. And our previous strategic plan really had a focus on healthy aging. So that's kind of how we got here. Mm -hmm. And when we started talking to folks about healthy aging and what, what to older adults need, what are really the health needs, um, yep. see a few things really rose to the top and continued to rise to the top. Social yep. isolation was a big one. Dementia and Alzheimer's. I'm just going to point your, your the wires. That's good. That's good. <laughs> um, and then caregiver support. Yeah. Uh, so mm -hmm. those are sort of the three things we sort of kept hearing from, from all around us. And I think they're um, they're not easy issues to tackle. And the care. Boy, boy, that they really all of, a lot that, that connects right, right into all of the issues around you know folks with memory loss. Right. Absolutely. And I think isolation we see a lot with folks with any sort of chronic disease. Mm -hmm. Right. And their caregivers' mm -hmm. isolation becomes a, a big issue. So I think we started sort of looking for pro some innovative ideas around this because you know there isn't yeah. a lot out there in terms yeah. of what works. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we funded a few programs for caregivers, um, one in Medfield, which is similar to Daybreak, where they have folks come into the center. Yeah. Um, one in uh, Franklin, where they actually have folks go to people's homes. Um, oh. And do sort of similar, just um, not not medical, just kind of interact while the caregiver can go and do whatever they need to do outside the house. I see. Um, and and it just as a just as a curiosity, in that case, are those volunteers going to people's homes, and you train the volunteers? Uh, is that staff? How is that? So it's paid staff. Yeah. I see. And folks pay a small fee um, for the service. I think it's ten dollars an hour, maybe similar to what yeah. you charge at the daybreak. Yeah. Um, so way way lower than we pay for. Uh, oh, for absolutely. To your, to your home. Right. Um, so we're targeting folks that just can't afford to, to pay some home you know, what the going rate is. So they actually go to the home and provide a respite they do, for the yeah. caregiver? Um, but I think mm -hmm. when sort of the daybreak concept came up, I mean, it just sort of seemed to us like something that could really work. And I think the senior centers are places where folks already go there, they already trust the staff, mm -hmm. they're already comfortable there, especially if some folks have been going there for a long time. So it just sort of makes sense for a venue. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, certainly the results have been tremendous from our um, point of view. So go back. This med, it was med, 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 Medfield. Mm -hmm. Medfield, and that's where you bring putting folks in the home. Um, no, so Medfield no. has a pro program similar to Daybreak where folks come to the center. I see. And, and is it at the senior center it's there at the also? Center I as well. see. It's yeah. So Franklin's the one where they go to the homes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So Franklin, they go to the homes. I see. And so, and how long have those other programs been running? The um, Franklin and the Medfield. So Medfield's been about. Five years, so we funded it for three years, and now it's sustainable beyond our funding. So I want to yeah. say it's about five. Franklin, four and five, probably similar. And in and in Medfield, and so I'm just curious because I think that's one yeah. one of the reasons why we decided to do these shows mm -hmm. was so that you could become aware not only of kind of what's going on in your mm -hmm. own community, mm -hmm. but also what's going on outside, so that yeah. you can kind of see mm -hmm. you know, as as mentioning earlier, kind of what kinds of things would you want to see, you mm -hmm. know, that could make that community be a kind of a, a better place, mm -hmm. you know. So h how how would you compare what's happened in Medfield? Are the programs run very similarly? The Medfield one to the Daybreak program? It sounds very similar. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they have um, sort of paid staff come in. They do a lot of activities with the loved ones who are there, a lot of sort of stimulation, a lot of stuff on memory. Um, and what I've heard from the director there is that sort of the same response, where the caregivers mm -hmm. love the break, but also the folks that come really get a lot out of the experience as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the caregivers also get to kind of see, you know, their loved ones can do something more, maybe, yeah. in some cases, yeah. which is actually nice as well. Yeah. And, and, and how does that, how does this program fit into the, once again, other stuff that, that Metro, in which Metro West has had an interest? Yeah, 
so I think around dementia, as you know as well, we've been looking at sort of age-friendly and dementia-friendly communities. Yeah. Um, so in the dementia-friendly community space, really taking a, a community approach to supporting folks with dementia, because we know the number of folks over 65 are going up, and also the number of folks with dementia and Alzheimer's is also increasing. So really yeah. looking at how, like you said, well, we're not a foundation that's going to fund the cure. Again, that would be fantastic, <laughs> and there are others working really hard on that. Right. But I think to sort of create environments where um, caregivers and folks with dementia and memory loss can really live a fulfilling life in their community. So training business folks, training retail folks to really be responsive, training first responders and police and fire to know if they go to a home and someone has memory loss or how to react and what's the best thing to do. Yeah. Um, I think it's been really effective in the communities that it started in. Mm -hmm. and, and, w and are there particular communities right now that you're focusing on doing that? Um, so we are funding um, Westboro. We just started funding we done with this, so don't forget anybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hudson, Northborough, Marlboro. Yeah, because it was really, in many ways, groundbreaking. I think, I think is, yeah. to, to give those communities the ability to try to figure out a plan for kind of where they wanted to go. Mm -hmm. right? And what else are you doing around, um, you, would, you would talk about social isolation mm -hmm. and other issues that are related to seniors. Are there other particular things that, that are happening in other places? that you think might be relevant here? Um, one sort of big, big thing we funded through BayPath was the Caregiving Metro West website, mm -hmm. um, which is yeah. for all the 25 towns we fund. And really it's just a resource they keep up to date um, with sort of everything a carrier could possibly need to know. You know, so where, do, where can you get a haircut? You know, bring your loved one with dimension to get a haircut, where mm -hmm. they're going to be welcoming and kind of um, make that a good experience. Yeah. That's a fabulous website. It's a fabulous mm -hmm. website. Yeah. We make referrals to that all the time. Yes. Yeah, so that's one of the best ways just to sort of get the right information out there. Okay. Um, and do you fund that like on an ongoing basis? We have. We're actually, I think our funding ended and they're fairly self-sustainable now with it. Um, we try to make three to five year grants and then hopefully things sustain themselves. Now the two programs you mentioned, are they self-sustaining at this point? They are. Really? Um, I know Franklin got um, some grant in their, for in their formula money, so some state money for it, and Medfield charges a little bit more than you do, and they were able to sustain it that way. Mm. Yeah, that's what, that's always mm. that's always yeah. one well of the. Well, that's challenges. the big question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <It> is, yeah. <laughs> and, and so, and where do you think the foundation will be? What, what do you think they're doing going forward? Are they? Do they? You had mentioned that they're that that healthy aging was part of the original strategic plan of the foundation. Mm -hmm. Is that still in the mix, or th is the foundation doing other doing other things now instead? So we have actually, as of last month or so, we have a new strategic plan, yeah. which actually shifts our focus a little bit, not so much away from healthy aging, but yeah. really looking at us to get more engaged in the community. We've done a lot of, made a lot sort of, said you know, we want to fund programs that focus on isolation or on caregiving and ask for proposals for that. Um, whereas now we're looking to be a little more proactive and sort of going to the community and saying, okay, what's going to truly improve your health? Um, really knowing that I think mm -hmm. some issues we've been focusing on still are most likely the right issues and I think certainly yep. older adults given the demographic shifts yep. um, is not something we're going to stop funding anytime soon. Um, mm -hmm. But I think just a little different way of coming at it. And I also think the age friendly dementia friendly concepts are ones we're really looking at closely. You know the Tufts Health Fund Foundation is also mm -hmm. doing a lot of work around that. Um, it's just an interesting way to kind of bring a lot of this stuff together um, in a kind of holistic mm -hmm. way. Right, right. It's been interesting to watch as the so-called age-friendly movement, which had been around mm -hmm. for 15 or 20 years, right, um, has, has dealt with this kind of burgeoning, you know, memory loss, dementia population, right, yeah. and, and, and trying to build into the programs the fact that just that, that, that it just seems like it just has to be part of any kind of program that deals with seniors is because that's, mm. that's where the issue shows up, yeah. right? So, I, so I'm I'm, just, I'm interested now as you're in, in, in terms of your new strategic plan. So, will you be reaching out into the? Will you be? W what's the plan to execute the plan? Yeah. So, um, so we have two. <laughs> Is that a fair question? Absolutely. Yeah. We have two initiatives that we're starting with. Um, one in Framingham and one in Natick. Yeah. Um, in Framingham, really, we're looking at South Framingham, which if you know the demographic is Framingham. Um, is sort of the region that has higher need. Um, right, so that's where Framingham Center is. is, yes. is, is south is, I always think of it as south of Route 9. Yep. Kind of, right? Exactly. Yep. Um, so really looking at engaging, the health, the, um, health department's going to lead that initiative, really looking at engaging community residents and just really asking them, like, what, what do you need? Like, what would truly improve your health? And then kind of going from there. And then today we're actually looking at an end-of-life conversation project, um, really trying oh. to um, engage the community in talking about 
um, you know, what do you want at the end of your life, um, what's going to make your life sort of, um, the most enjoyable it can be, and having those conversations not at the end of life, but, you know, um, before, now, uh, yeah, yeah that's, that's important. Yeah. So, so th this sounds like, <laughs> <laughs> sounds like the Honoring Choices program. Is, 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 are, are, you oh, looking right. at a, yeah. are you looking at a particular <laughs> model for doing that? I, w it, w I know that, Jan once again, Jan is always cutting edge, right? <laughs> has been really interested in Hudson here, about in, in really encouraging some kind of Honoring Choices. We're um, an Honoring Choices partner, as <coughs> you are. Yes, yep. yes. But, but then there is also the, what is it called? A, the similar program done by the Institute for Healthcare. The Conversation Project. The Conversations oh. Project. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so is the, w it, uh, are you using one of those particular, one of those models? So we've been working, we've been talking <coughs> about the Conversation Project. Their mm -hmm. director um, actually lives in Wellesley. Um, so we've been having conversations with her around kind of how they've done this around the country. Um, I think the programs are very similar from what I've heard. Right. There's a huge difference, but really um, just kind of trying to facilitate those conversations between folks. And then also the legal pieces and the healthcare proxies and right. that end of it as well. And that's kind of like an automatic. No, the reason why I ask is personal that directives. Right. That's really important. Right. And because it mm -hmm. might be interesting. Are are you far far enough along in Natick that it would be worth having somebody come over? <coughs> excuse me, and talk about the conversations project, kind of as a as a complement to the honoring choices mm -hmm. stuff that we've talked about. Yeah, we are just starting. We're just forming the steering committee, so I think maybe in a few months. Yes. Yeah. And, and so now, Marie, I want to go back sure. and talk about and ask you about kind of the question that one of the questions that I started with. So from your perspective now, have you gone through what you went through, you and your husband together, mm -hmm. what, ki have you, what kinds of things do you think would have made your life during those years, right, mm -hmm. easier when you were living in the, you know, the both of you living in the community? Wanting, obviously your husband wanting to stay at home, you wanting him to stay at home, but wanting to be in a community that's supportive of all of that, right? Can you think of things that would have been helpful in terms of improving those years? That's a broad question. It is, yeah. yeah. Well, for sure, um, if there had been some sort of a group of caregivers that um, I could have gone to to understand you know, the process and what was ahead. Yeah. Um, but also if the community itself, like Hudson, like some other communities had the same program, uh, I, I certainly think he would have gone sooner. Um, you know, that's uh, without knowing yeah. anything else that's possible. Yeah. I mean, that certainly would have been helpful. Um, or a, a group of caregivers to get together in some way. Um, and I at least express, you know, what they were going through and maybe find some problem solving within that group. I, I don't know, really. No, uh, I, was I was just curious. Yeah. I was curious because yeah. I know that when, when we went through the dementia-friendly communities effort, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, we, we kind of danced around that question of actually putting together a group of caregivers. Yes. Right? And having, and having them talk about, mm -hmm. you know, what might be useful in the community as opposed to just doing outreach into particular sectors. So I was just, yeah, I, I was curious be helpful, about that. Yeah. Because yeah. that might be helpful, that might be helpful in a number of other communities. Sure. And is, and is there an on, any kind of ongoing caregiver support group in Hudson? Is there anything formalized? Not that I'm aware of. No. no. Not that I'm aware of. I believe that there might be s something going on at one of the nursing homes. Maybe Marlboro Hills. Yes, yeah. So we we might even want to have to talk about talk to those folks and see if we want to have somebody on just to talk about caregiver support and how it relates to all this stuff. Right. So I just really thank you, of course, for for <laughs> for doing this. Right? This is a this is a lot of fun. I really want to thank you, Marie, for for being willing to come on and kind of talk about your own experience. I know that one of the greatest challenges I think in dealing with all folks and dealing with memory loss issues is the tendency of folks to really not want to talk about it because right. it's so private. And, you know, we get that. Mm -hmm. but, but, but as a result, a lot of this conversation doesn't occur and a lot of average folks who aren't going through it don't understand, just don't understand. Mm -hmm. And the more they understand, the easier, I think, all of this, all of this gets. And Rebecca, I really want to thank you for, for uh, coming on and talking about what Metro West Health has done and for supporting this program as well as yes. the Dementia Friendly Communities Program. Mm -hmm. I think that you know, ideas. It's I always, I always 
one of my mantras is that money follows good ideas. But the point is that there's no money. The <laughs> ideas just don't mm. have any place to go. Mm. And to be able to just, I think if, I think the, the, the investments have really provided the impetus to do some really substantial things in these communities. I think the folks in the community, I live in Malta, right? So I think we're all pretty indebted to that. So, so thank you very much for coming on. Um, thank you all for watching, and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next installment of Frank and Mary in Hudson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.